nano exposures. I'd like to talk about a few aspects in this presentation. Um, general concepts of exposure, the nano world, how to measure exposure. So I would be talking mainly from the angle of measurements, just a few comments about uh, uh, modeling, but uh, measurements will be the main focus. Uh, issues of background, peak concentrations, SOA, secondary organic aerosols, and uh, some comments about exposure control. I always like to look back at what was done in the past, whether uh, exposure, in fact, was evaluated in the uh, old times. We would consider that exposure is something we started doing very, very recently. But in a way, if we look back what was happening around that time, we would already find elements of exposure assessment, if not quantitative, but qualitative, and also uh, ideas for exposure control. So uh, Pliny the Elder, elder uh, Roman officer, uh, suggested this. Query slaves from asbestos mines uh, not be purchased because they young they die young. So exposure, that's qualitative assessment of exposure and risk. <coughs> and also suggested what to do to control this exposure. Uh, it's actually an interesting comment. This was known long, long time ago. And it took almost 2,000 years, not quite, but short about 100 years, before asbestos control was properly put in regulation. So I hope that the type of exposures we are talking on about now uh, to new types of uh, materials will not take 2,000 years to um, put controls for. <coughs> what is exposure? There are lots of definitions you can find in many different places. And part of the problem is that exposure is a word term which we use all the time in every day in relation to just anything. And therefore, are, the definitions are so mixed up and the ideas of what exposure is uh, are really sometimes completely misrepresented. So basically, um, it is an event when a person comes into contact with a pollutant. So we've got a concentration and time. These two factors have, have to be uh, present. And also that usually, not always, exposure is a part of a health risk assessment process. What I'd like to show you now in a sort of very um, concept nature, how that uh, risk assessment is conducted and what is part uh, the exposure plays in this. So as I said, exposure is concentration and time. And in this sort of very first level of understanding, you could look at this as just multiplication. Pollutant concentration multiplied by exposure duration. Uh, in relation to some pollutants, it works very well. And if you are talking about radiation exposure, that is cal calculated, there are units for this, units which make make sense in that the sense was attached to them. If you are talking to po about airborne pollutants, whether particles or gaseous pollutants, it doesn't have meaning as such. If we say particles um, um, PM 2.5 micrograms per cubic meter per s uh, second, multiplied by second, it doesn't have meaning as such. And that's part of the problem. Anyway, this is exposure, concentration by time. Now, those is exposure multiplied by dosimetry factors. What are they? Say we are inhaling the pollutants into our lung. Some of these, um, say, particles will be deposited in the lung. And this depends on our individual dosimetry factors of the lung shape, flow rates, and so on. So not all the pollutants which enter the lung will be deposited or um, uh, uh, go into further step, uh, steps of this. So exposure multiplied by dosimetry factors. Then lifetime individual risk, dose by dose multiplied by dose response relationship. And then we risk of exposed population, individual multiplied by exposed population. Now, this is a very simplistic and very concept view of this. Um, one part of the issue is that in many cases we go from here, exposure, 
directly to not dose but exposure response relationship because we simply don't have all these factors. So most of the epidemiology is based on exposure, uh, exposure response relationship. So this is a concept which I think it is a useful concept to have in mind, but it's extremely simplistic. Uh, part of the issue is that in none of the cases, this is just a simple multipli uh, multiplication, in most cases we are talking about some kind of uh, functions. When we are talking about pollutant concentration, there's never just one value for any extended period of time. We always some, have some kind of function in which uh, pollution concentration varies. Exposure duration, I'll mention this separately, again, it is something which we not always know for particular people or exposure groups. So then exposure becomes a function. Then dosimetry, uh, it's another area of complexities from which arise dose. A response factor, whether it's dose response or exposure response factor, uh, can have all kinds of different functions. It can, could be linear like this, without a threshold, could have a threshold, could have any other type of functions, and we often don't quite know these functions. Uh, so then is individual risk uh, and so on. So as you can see from this very simple concept what it is, we, we are immediately getting into the uh, uh, quite high level of complex complexities. How, how to measure and assess or assess exposure? Now again from a very broad perspective there are these possible ways of doing this starting from the ideal, the best, to the least accurate. So in the ideal world, we'll put personal monitor on absolutely everybody to monitor every aspect of exposure we want, and we have perfect data for this. Obviously, this is impossible. So the next best thing is to do micro environment concentration measurements. So say we want to assess our exposure here during this seminar in this room, so we'll put a monitor somewhere here of whatever we want, and this will then represent uh, our exposure here. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, or, if this is not possible, we would say, okay, lo let's look at the concentration in the air shed measurement somewhere at the monitoring station, somewhere in Haifa, and let's relate this to our exposures here, which would be partially true because some of this um, <laughs> um, airborne pollutant penetrated inside, but obviously this will not take into account indoor pollutants. Then we could use factors or concentrations of other pollutants used as surrogates. For example, we are interested in exposures to ultrafine particles from traffic. We can't measure this, but we measure CO or NOx, and let's say they are surrogates for traffic. Or if we don't have any other data, we use, say, fuel burns. So we could say that all the vehicles in this period of time in this um, uh, city burn this amount of fuel, this then translate in, uh, translates into this amount of concentrations. But the further we go along these lines, obviously the less accurate the assessments are. Uh, I won't be talking about these aspects, I'll just talk a little bit about this first too. Just some comments about how personal exposure is or could be monitored. Uh, we are talking about particles, so particle mass, what has been done and has been done for quite a long time already using this kind of personal impactor, small devices and a pump, so we pump air through this. Uh, it also uh, can and uh, often has an impactor, therefore we restrict what's deposited here, let's say to PM2.5 or PM10. Uh, what we get as a result of this is a total mass deposited in the period of time which uh, we are assessing exposure and at the end we will get the average uh, concentration or translating exposure uh, later. Now this is the next step from this and here this is um, the device called NanoTracer which measures particle number concentration and we are going here to the very small size uh, basically from about five nanometers to uh, 
about 200 nanometers. So as you can see, this measures personal exposure, does it in real time, and gives one second resolution, dependently on the, what, what mode we set. In either case, it is possible now, but obviously you are still wearing a bulk device attached to you, which presents some complexities. I'll uh, later on come uh, back to the result of this kind of monitoring. But now a few comments about microenvironment concentration monitoring. So say we, ca we can't measure personal exposure, let's put a monitor here. What are the issues with this? The first is where in the microenvironment to measure. Let's say we put the monitor here because it's outside of where you guys are walking, but then there's much less mixing here, so therefore the concentration here will not represent concentration in the middle of the room. So this is one of the big problems, and particularly we, uh, when we are considering more uh, complex environments. Um, and then we are talking about uh, exposure to nanoparticles, into particles, what particle properties to measure. I've already mentioned two of them, mass, number, what, are we, what to measure. It depends. It depends on the aim of the study, but there are some more complexities into this as well. So we will um, again discuss it uh, in a little bo a bit more detail uh, in a moment. So from what we've already briefly discussed, we can say that we can, uh, in the simplistic way, assess the exposure in the microenvironments in two very simple ways, either using time ser series approach based on the instantaneous concentration at any moment, so this is the nanotracer, or time average approach based on average concentration at the time spent in the microenvironment. Very simple two equations, nothing really to this, so we've got the uh, time uh, ba exposure based on sim uh, simultaneous, uh, instantaneous concentration, concentration, so that instantaneous concentrations are based on the average concentration, and this is the time we are using. So, the world, the, again, the concept is very simple, and the world would be beautiful if we could just use this equation, we would have all this data to, uh, to plug into this equation and to calculate this. Uh, I've mentioned the issues related to measurements, what to measure, how to measure, and so on. But uh, if you are considering individual, if you focus on an individual, okay, we can track this individual, who, what she or he is doing. But now, if we are extending to this to any population group, it immediately comes an issue what those people are doing, in which microenvironment they spend time, how to track this. So this gets to the issue of time activity data. <coughs> there are lots of ways of getting uh, the data, dependently again, what's the aim of the study, what's the population you are studying, from National Bureau of Statistics questionnaires, surveys, diaries, videotaping, GPS information, and so on. Uh, this is, in fact, a topic for a separate presentation, but it is not something just straightforward, just do this. It, in every project and every microenvironment brings different issues. For example, we, were, um, uh, we are conducting a project in a, a hospital environment, in a, a children's hospital, in a ward, children's ward. So we would like to track the movement of people, medical professionals and other people, to be able then to link this with the pattern of infection spread in this um, particular environment. So um, well, we know where the children are, we can monitor and model all kinds of other parameters, but how to monitor and how to find out what exactly is the movement of individual people, particularly uh, medical do the doctors which are coming just for investigations. There's no way to put a, any videotaping there. GPS is not um, providing sufficient resolution in this indoor environment. So there are technologies which uh, can help with this, but again, this is an example that it is um, not something really straightforward. <coughs> 
So this is a very, very brief and conceptual introduction to exposure. And uh, let's uh, now go to the nano world and to the issue of nanoparticles. What are nanoparticles? There are quite a number of definitions. In general, part, uh, particles smaller than 100 nanometers, but sometimes um, are considered smaller than 50 or even smaller than 30 nanometers. In the grand scheme of, of objects or particles which are in the air, uh, if this is everything which is in the air up to about 100 micrometers, if they are bigger than this, they are too big and deposited, uh, so um, they, are, they won't stay in the air. So this is the range of particles which stay in the air. This is a, the range of particles which are important uh, in relation to health. Uh, particles smaller than 10 micrometers, these are the particles which can get into the resp uh, be, um, uh, respired. And this is our range of nanoparticles. Now, this immediately tells us something very important. These particles are never in the air by themselves. They are always in the presence of all kinds of other particles. I think I've already mentioned two types of definitions talking about nanoparticles, but a moment ago I brought up the issue of ultrafine particles. What is the, di what is the difference between nanoparticles and ultrafine particles? It's a huge difference. And you assess it by yourself. According to the ISO definition, a nanoparticle is a particle with a minimal diameter smaller than about 100 nanometers. <coughs> Very clear. An ultrafine particle is a particle size about 100 nanometers in diameter or less. Very different, isn't it? <laughs> you are looking uh, kind of uh, with disbelief. <laughs> What I'm saying is not quite what you are re reading here, right? Well, this is basically the same. The issue is that these two terms are used in different fields. Ultrafine particles, ultrafine is traditionally used in atmospheric sciences. And until some few years ago, nobody would call particles in this size range in atmospheric sciences as nanoparticles. Nanoparticles would be those smaller than 50 or 30 nanometers, if you look at the literature from that field. However, in the field of the engineered nanoparticles, uh, this is nanoparticle, and they don't use this terminology. The field of atmospheric sciences started using uh, nanoparticles as well, and now you can find mix in the literature, simply because this is trendy. So if you put a grant application, so <laughs> it's much better to call these particles nanoparticles, and then the chances of getting a grant are higher. So this is just the kind of reality check <laughs> on what's happening. There's another <coughs> issue, uh, if we are to stay for a, uh, another few seconds with the classification of particles. So as we know, there are the um, PM10, PM2.5, mass concentration of particles uh, with this aerodynamic diameter. And they are also ultrafine particles, as we've, uh, that's coming now from, uh, from the atmospheric sciences, smaller than uh, uh, 1.5. These are called fine particles, and again, it's a man-made definition. But the issue important here is that this is measured by mass. It is mass concentration. And ultrafine <coughs> particles, or nanoparticles, however we call them, it's basically always measured by number, number concentration. And the simple reason for this is that the mass of these particles is so small that the uh, sensitivity of the devices measuring mass in this range is simply not there. So we basically always talk about number concentration. Just to make it sort of a bit different, this is always mass concentration per cubic meter, while this is always most time mass concentration per cubic centimeter. Uh, it's probably because the instruments used uh, for this 
report data in this way and therefore I have a very good feel what would be the concentration here of particles per cubic centimeter, per cubic meter, I would have to recalculate this in, in my mind. Nanoparticles in indoor air, ultrafine particles, come uh, from uh, several types of different sources. Um, in the first instance, combustion processes, and there's a long list of them, starting with uh, cars, obviously this is coming from outside, industry, cigarettes, inside, biomass burning, basically any type of combustion which relates to uh, indoor environment. Uh, particle formation, secondary organic aerosols, and it could be several different types of mechanisms, ozone-initiated chemistry, nucleation, uh, ion-initiated uh, chemistry, and so on, so uh, nucleation, so um, uh, this is a second type. Now we are adding to this engineered nanoparticles, and again there are several types of different particles and several different ways in this uh, particles are generated. Combustion, uh, I touched upon combustion and this type of uh, distributions in my presentation on Monday when we talked about uh, urban air and we pointed out to the fact that particles from combustion are always very small and the majority of the particles are in this size below uh, 100 nanometers. But we can add to this also particles from uh, this is that uh, burning of wood in this stove. And again, you can see that these particles are the majority of the particles are below 100 nanometers. The same goes for any type of combustion. Now, what you see on this diagram, the peak is shifted a little bit above 100 nanometers, but this is very old, very aged smoke. When it was first emitted, it was well below 100 nanometers. But if the concentration is high and it stays, whether a room or a cham chamber, and has enough time to, co to grow by coagulation, that's where it uh, ends up. Just a few comments about uh, engineered nanoparticles. Uh, I'll have some uh, size distributions uh, later. Uh, and then additional complexity when talking about engineered nanoparticles is that the variety of different shapes which are not necessarily common to the other like combustion particles. For example, when we are talking about carbon nanotubes, uh, which are classified as uh, nanofibers, so they are of a very different shape then a uh, very uh, shape very different to spherical and now if you think about the devices like SMPs, CPCs and so on they always express what's happening to these particles or they assess these particles ba based on their sphericity this is not so so this is another factor which if you really want to uh, get deep deeply into the science of what the instruments measure you need to consider aspects like this so how do we uh, detect nanoparticles? From that summary from a moment ago, we know that that's where they are. So this is a typical size distribution in, uh, in the air, like in this room, for example, coming from, from outside, mainly from vehicles, but also from nucleation. So this is measured by number. Uh, if we attempted to recalculate them into mass, assuming that they are spherical, which as we've discussed, they are not. And if we knew a density, this is what we would come up. <coughs> and that's what I already mentioned on Monday, that here, where is the majority of the particles by number, there is basically nothing by mass, and vice versa, where the mass is, uh, there's basically no number. So um, number concentration, uh, is the parameter which is used for detection of nanoparticles. And we can now go with the devices available for this to very, very small, to about two nanometers. And this, this is pushing now, the, uh, the boundary is pushing the definitions as well. The question, what is nanoparticle? This is basically molecular or even atomic size. So is an atom or a molecule a particle uh, as I said, it's a gray area discussed at the aerosol conference, but I think basically the answer is, is yes, as long as they stay in the air and not attached to anything, that's what it is. 
But despite the many techniques uh, available and the progress which has been made in this, there are still many measurement challenges. So if we wanted to use any of these techniques for uh, routine monitoring or application to standard monitoring, there are uh, still big issues with this. So going back to the issue what to measure, uh, we've already discussed mass number, mass or size distribution, aspect ratio, surface area, chemical composition, morphology, toxicity, etc. Et so if you are asked to do exposure assessment to specific type of particles, say printer emissions, which one of these parameters to choose? Well, one may say that it depends on the aim of the study whether you are interested in the uh, processes occurring in the printer or whether you are interested in the exposure or health effects. But what if we know the aim, we formulated the aim and we still don't know to what to measure. For example, there's a big discussion in relation to health effects, whether um, particle number is a good measure or perhaps surface area because surface area is the contact area between the particle and lung epithelium. So surface area is perhaps a better parameter. But there are ways of measuring surface area, but it's nowhere near as straightforward as particle number. So there are big questions about this. What instrumentation to use? Um, again, there is a selection of different options, starting with concentration, which is uh, up to now usually measured by condensation particle counters, but there's a new family of interest, uh, instruments coming, and that nanotracer which I showed you is one of them, when it's not measured based on condensation on the particles, but on um, charging the particles and, and the current. So then we've got size distribution devices like scanning, mobility, particle sizer, surface area, but here we are not talking about family of instruments. I know about basically two instruments which could do this and there are same issues with them. Now composition morphology, direct and indirect methods, the majority of them are indirect methods which are not in line. Uh, there are instruments like time of light mass spectrometers, but they don't go to our nano size. They, uh, they, for example, the one which we have goes to with difficulties and depends what isotope it goes to uh, about 70 nanometers. So it doesn't go all the way down. So the first conclusion from this is that there are many different ways to characterize nanoparticles choice of parameter or parameters depends on the aim of the study, particle number concentration is still the easiest to measure and that's what we typically use for this assessment. But still there are no standard ways of doing this and therefore if you are using any experimental data you should have to look very, very carefully of, uh, on how this was measured. I will touch very briefly on particle dynamics and what happens with these nanoparticles. I'll talk a little bit more about this on um, Sunday when I talk about particle dynamics. But basically, what most of us probably know very well, we have these three modes in the particle distribution. Therefore, there's not, not vertical scale because we are talking about just the locations of them. So it's nucleation mode. It is the accumulation mode and it is the coarse mode. And here are the particles uh, from condensation of hot vapor during combustion, nucleation of particles. Here it is like, um, uh, on the one hand, we've got the primary emissions like soot from combustion, but also gas to particle um, uh, reactions, chemical reactions, condensation, coagulation. It is just a sink for everything and particularly for what's happening here. And finally, the uh, coarse particles, so there are many mechanical processes. The point in this is that while we are interested when we are talking about nanoparticles, nano exposures in this size range, but these particles don't stay here for very long, they move into the accumulation mode. 
So if you are set to measure these nano exposures, you've got to remember that in no time at all, and with time, they will be out of the nano world, if that's how you define them. This is an example of <coughs> coagulation and how it uh, impacts on particle size. Uh, a time series of measurements of cigarette smoke uh, in a well, brick house air exchange rate. So we've got here a count median diameter and concentration. This is concentration, this is count median diameter in the time of uh, about three hours. So what you can see that concentration as expected is going down and there are several processes. Part of this is uh, air exchange rate which removes them but part of this is um, a coagulation and here we can see the increase in count median diameter. So we started in the range which we could say it's the nano size below 100 nanometers but in the process they grew up bigger. And if the concentrations were higher, they were not extremely high here, this process of, of growth would be, would be even uh, higher. So what we have to always remember is that nanoparticles grow and may not uh, be nano upon reaching the receptor. Therefore, larger particles should be measured as well by number of mass. That's actually one step further. If we are focusing on the nano world as defined by 100 nanometers, in fact, there is no instrument which just measures 100 nanometers. If we are measuring size distribution, we have size distribution going up to, well, uh, nano tracer to 200 nanometers, SMPS about one micrometer. So it is that division between nano and larger particle is blurred, but also because they move to, to this sizes. Now there's another issue in uh, measuring these exposures or estimating this and I will illustrate this on this particular example of particle concentrations in an office. So this is an office and it is one of our offices at QUT. Uh, this is an entrance to the office and we've got here some desk around. Uh, here we've got a printer We've got air inlet, a second inlet, and this is air outlet. So the parameters and so on. Now, the issue here is that if this computer operates, uh, if this printer operates, and if this printer is an emission, uh, is an emitter, where will we find particles from this printer in this office? Now, if we didn't know anything about emissions and all of this, uh, we wouldn't know. And we even if we didn't know that this is a source, as it often happens, again, where are we putting the measurements? Now, it was a very careful CFD modeling done of the situation. And not surprisingly, it showed that the particles are found only in this particular area. And this is the air outlet. Now you may, it's kind of obvious, you may ask why, uh, why I'm showing this and why we are talking about this. In this particular case was after we, uh, after we established through our measurements that a printer could be very high emitters of particles. We have to have a printer here, there are students' desks here. So the students were very, very careful to uh, do this kind of to, to do this kind of measurements and modeling to make sure that the printer is located such that it doesn't impact them. So this was no research project. They got together, they did measurements, modeling, and the whole paper came out of this to make sure that they are protected. But if we didn't know all of these things, and if let's say this is the situation, or if the printer is somewhere here and the particles are spread around, so it very much then depends where we put the mon monitor, what 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 we measure. So measurements of emissions like this or from uh, sources of nanoparticles is very uh, local and depend and therefore cho very um, careful choice of um, adequate spatial coverage of monitoring is uh, abs absolutely essential to, to do it in a meaningful way. Now, uh, another big uh, problem in all of this is particle versus the omnipresent background, which can be illustrated by this uh, 
traffic outside and there's plenty of traffic outside everywhere, outside here as well, and uh, these particles penetrate inside. So this is what we've um, already discussed the particles are from traffic. They are very small, dependently from which fuel they could be smaller or slightly bigger. And as a result of this, we have this distribution of particles in ambient air, and the majority of them are in the 100 nanometers. So if we are interested in nano exposures, and if we are interested to, ex to nano exposures to something which is not traffic, we've got to be aware that we always have this big background of the nanoparticles wherever we are, and the background varying at time and space. Um, this uh, always reminds me of one of our very first studies when we were sort of getting into this area. And one particular issue here was the uh, measurements of particles um, in surgical theaters. So um, this is the hospital. Um, and this is the size distribution of outdoor particles. So concentrations, 100, um, 0.1 micrometer, 100 nanometer concentration. Now, what we can see here, the distribution is bimodal. As expected, this is petrol and some nucleation. This is diesel, fine. So then we did measurements in the surgical theaters and quite a number of them. And in all of them, we found this distribution, which points out to a present of a source which gives this almost monodispersed, well, not monodispersed, not quite monodispersed, but it's one peak here, uh, unimodal. So we search for all possible sources. What are the sources in these surgical theaters? There were no surgical procedures occurring in any of them. So well, it, we were really scratching our heads, uh, heads. Eventually, we collected all the cleaners used for this. We did chamber experiments and so on. We couldn't point out to anything. Until we repeated, just we came back to this hospital a few months later, and it just happened that when we did these measurements, it rained for, it was a torrential rain, which really cleaned the outdoor air. And that's what we found out, that what we see here is transformation of this distribution through the uh, building ventilation uh, system, which removes more efficiently these particles by diffusion and all the other processes which are important for this size. And this size particles, because of impaction and whatever, imp uh, is more efficient for larger particles. So this is transformation of this. And in fact, this is background from outside. So these are outdoor particles transported by the uh, uh, building. Now, this is another uh, example of background. Um, these are printed emitted particles in an office. Time series, uh, eight hours working day, particle concentration. Uh, now, there are two distances uh, from the printer, and I won't talk about this uh, more at this point. What I wanted to point out is that while we have this peaks from printer, they are all the time sitting on this background, and these are particles which came from outside. This is the background. And these are in the same size as our printer particles. So if we don't understand very well this printer, this assessment wouldn't make much sense. So always control for background. Another issue is, which you could, could have all already concluded from the previous graph, that uh, Basically, all the sources, indoor sources, and all the sources generated our nano, uh, generating our nanoparticles operate in the transient nature, which means there is short period of operation, they stop operating. It's not like outdoor, where obviously there is a, a temporal variation, but it's not so sharp. In indoor environment, it is very sharp. And then going back to the same graph, now we are focusing not on the background, but we are focusing on these peaks. So these peaks result from printer operation. And you can see that while concentrations occasionally are significantly higher than the background, so this printer significantly contribute to the concentrations, but in each case, this is a very sharp peak. So trying to assess this by 
some kind of average, you know, what? You can do this uh, this way, but it won't give you any idea about these peaks, and this obviously can be important. Um, another example here is um, engineered nanoparticles, uh, titanium dioxide particles. This is um, a process in a, conducted in a lab. So it's a time series, and this is particle concentration. So again, you could see here this the uh, blue, this blue is uh, outdoor measurements, which varies, as you can see. Um, this was a um, <coughs> ground floor, sort of a big lab, and outside occasionally there was a vehicle or something. But again, you can see these big peaks from operation uh, of this process, and dependently what, what was happening, sometimes it's a peak of both particle number and mass, sometimes just one of these. But in any case, that's how they operate. It's not by no means continuous operation. Uh, the same here shows in terms of particle uh, count median diameter. So it is sitting, the diameter is this hovering around this 50 something, the outdoor, and occasionally there is a big shift in the diameter because of the process. So conclusion five from here is that uh, transient nature needs to be captured through proper measurement testing and poten potentially has an important uh, impact on uh, uh, exposure characteristics. Now, a few comments about uh, secondary particle formation indoors, and again, I will uh, slightly deepen on this uh, topic on Sunday. These are particles, uh, I would say, generated by printers, but technically they are not generated by printers. These are secondary particles formed in the air from the from nucleation of the vapors which were emitted during the printing process. Uh, this, uh, this is the size distribution and there are three printers but if we focus on this this was the high emitter so we can see that the peak of this particle is here below the that what we set our range of uh, uh, nanoparticles. So it was most cases around uh, 40, 50 nanometers. And these are secondary particles. They are not emitted by printers, they are formed in the air. Another example is this one, a secondary organic aerosols in the primary school. Again, I'll talk a little bit more about this process uh, on Sunday. But what we can see here, there are, there are several days of measurements and particle concentrations, and some of them are quite high. If we are reaching the range of 10 to the fifths, these are not the concent typical concentration, the 10 to the fifths per cubic centimeter, that these are not typical concentration found outdoors unless we are in a very traffic um, dense area. So we have these peaks ever so often, and this was a project in which we came across this issue by a chance, and eventually the conclusion was that the culprits here are the many products which are in the classrooms of this primary school used for art. So we are talking about paints, glues, flamasters, and it looks like uh, really like a chemistry laboratory with all of this which is there. Nothing of this is uh, regulated, controlled, comes from all over the world. We don't quite know what it is in these in this things, but they generate these particles and they are very small. This, these are the secondary particles. When we do a uh, mental shift now to engineered nanoparticles. Many of the engineered nanoparticles are also formed as secondary, so in the gas phase by chemical reactions, whether gases, liquids or droplets, condensation and growth. So the process is in a way the same as the particles uh, or the concept of the process, the particles generated from printers or from these uh, paints. So um, it could be industrial or reset generation of these uh, nanoparticles. So, first presence of atmospheric SOA uh, can interfere with investigations of nanoparticles in the air if we are focusing on specific types of sources, they are present, but science of atmospheric SOA 
is very useful for nano-engineered particles. So that's where these two uh, disciplines um, overlap. When exposure should be controlled? And this is always a huge question, which in a way goes outside uh, of many of what we do here, I mean, we scientists. Exposure control is something which is usually the responsibility of somebody else, not, not us. But then the questions are asked to us, in the absence of specific standards or guidelines, how to decide what uh, process need control, how to account for peak concentrations, are they important in relation to health? Now, and this is a whole jungle from which there isn't really an easy way out. So this was at some stage we did um, an assessment of what's available in terms of standards. For, so you can, it's certainly not complete. But what you can see that you can find only s several small number of types of nanoparticles which are here and some specific aspects of this. So if, let's say, going back to our issue of printers, which one to relate to this? There's no, nothing which will point out as to this. There's something else which I found out working with my PhD student who comes from the occupational exposure area, and there are some uh, principles like this. Uh, what you can do, you control them where the, expo where the uh, 30 minute short term particle exposure is over three times particle reference values. 30 minutes in eight hours working day. Or where a single peak value exceeds five times particle reference value. Each of you immediately looks at this and, and asks why. Uh, and it will differ, we would imagine differs for different uh, substances, compounds and so on. So, but that's basically the only what's available. So in our case, we had, say, um, um, 4,000 particles per cubic centimeter, so that this was the reference value. But it's, it's very arbitrary in my mind. Whether uh, it is useful to use the time weight average exposure. So in this case, we, it was printer uh, evaluation. So uh, in all of this, uh, where the um, printer particle exposure was smaller than the uh, TWA2 background particles. Uh, so we could say that the majority of these particles came from sources outside, not the printers. So basically, the TWA is not the best measure of printed related exposure. There's another way of... Uh, attempting to do this utilization of particle control values. And again, there's a whole jungle of different definitions which are not necessary uh, relating to each other. And I've just listed them here. For any of you who will, would, would work with any outside partners who would want some practical information of this. But as I said, it is, there's really no easy way out of this. In, um, one of our assessments, uh, we use this particular set of uh, measurements, a device to P-track to uh, measure particles in this size range, uh, particle number, OPC, particle mass, dust track, uh, and so on. And through this, we found out that this was efficient in, uh, in evaluating emission sources, breathing zone exposure, and so on. But basically, this is pointing out, it was possible to do it, we could do it, but in each kind, in each case, this is a research project. This is not something which we can say to the, whoever takes care of these things in, in the real occupational environment, you do it yourself. It, it, it is a research project. Or, coming back to the issue of personal exposure, uh, this is this, these are the size distribution, these are the time series from these nanotracers, which gives us a very good information about the microenvironments. In this case, we are not in one environment like this emissions from printer or titanium dioxide, dioxide. <coughs> uh, these are different microenvironments. And we've got this instantaneous concentrations and exposures. This, for example, served as to calculate because this was an interest in health surface area, 
Uh, those surface area was based on recalculating the number into mass, uh, into surface area. And there we found out that commuting uh, had this inhaled surface area, while home sleeping uh, had this. So one would say, okay, commuting is less important than home uh, sleeping. And this is kind of, kind of intuitive. But the issue here is that this didn't ta take account, obviously, the time. The time in commuting is much shorter than time in, uh, uh, when sleeping. But if you calculate this into relative intensity when you tame a, a time factor, so then you can see that commuting has the highest relative intensity compared to home sleeping, which is the smallest. So this is the kind of assessment we can get. We've then repeated these measurements in uh, Italy with our colleagues from Casino, using uh, this in several different uh, schools uh, and got an estimation of exposure in to urban schools versus rural, rural schools and very interesting data on the role of different microenvironments in, in this exposure. We are also doing this now, or basically have done it now, and uh, submitted a paper for this in Bhutan, where the issues were completely different, and the exposures during cooking were of this uh, extreme, extreme values. So conclusion from here is exposure control to nanoparticles differs from air quality, guidelines on standards type of exposure, transient nature need to uh, be uh, uh, considered and different exposure characteristics. Something which I will not talk about at all, but just point out to this, the awareness of this. Are we aware of exposures conducting any of this kind of experiments? And from what we've seen with colleagues handling engineered nanoparticles uh, or making these particles, and if they are doing this on a lab bench, no one is. And exposure to um, environmental nanoparticles, whether cars, uh, candles or whatever, it's basically non-existent. To conclude, the issue of exposome. This is like a vision for the future, the environmental complement to genome. So the exposome is composed of every exposure to which an individual is subjected from con uh, conception to death. Therefore, it requires consideration of the nature and exposures of a change per time. We are looking at this and saying, well, this is some kind of science fiction. How are we going to get all of this information and data? So is this science fiction? Referring again to genome, uh, it wasn't that long ago when DNA sequencing per day per sequences was this. Today is this. So others and others of magnitude, this increase. Uh, if we consider that the genetic factors contribute, as assessed about 10% to variability, environmental factors to 90%, of which we understand about 10%. So this kind of assessment through exposome and using on all kinds of technologies and devices which come into uh, into being, well, we may be one day be able to calculate exposome. So thank you for your attention, Torda. I wanted to finish with something which relates to that issue that exposure has different meanings in the uh, everyday language. I have learned through my life as a composer, chiefly through my mistakes and pursuits of false assumptions not by my exposure to fountains of wisdom and knowledge. Toda. <laughs>